Hello, and welcome to Analytical Figure Drawing 2 uh, through CGMA. My name is Michael Hampton, and this is uh, the introduction to our first week of lecture, which will be on drapery. So there's quite a bit of information to get through today, but I do want to take uh, the first couple minutes here and maybe go over quickly um, some things about the course, um, short introduction, and then maybe just get into some quick resources for you. Um, so, first of all, uh, to give you some kind of brief introduction to myself, um, uh, this is a site that I keep, figuredrawing.info, for the different um, things that I end up doing um, with the uh, figure drawing classes that I've been teaching now for um, around 10 years. Uh, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, but that's a point of difference uh, that I think is maybe important to point out early on is that I don't um, have a um, interest or right now I'm not working in, in the industry as a concept artist or production artist or anything like that. Um, primarily I teach or I've written a book on figure drawing called Figure Drawing Design and Invention which is kind of what, what's being shown here. Um, it's also what the first class is based on, the f analytical figure drawing one through CGMA. And the purpose of this book, um, or this site in general, is to just kind of help people out with the kind of difficult task of learning the figure, um, anatomy, um, structure, gesture, all of that kind of stuff uh, that I as a student had some difficulty with definite challenge to uh, kind of learn this stuff, learn it well, learn it quickly uh, so that it can be applied to other things like uh, lighting or uh, design or character invention or digital painting whatever it is that your um, ultimate interest is in. So that's always been the role that I've enjoyed and something that I've pursued um, as an interest is teaching. That's really what I I love to do. Um, I'm also actively involved in other avenues in the arts. Um, I have uh, my undergraduate degree from Art Center College of Design in Pasadena and I have an additional master's degree in painting and fine art studies and I also have a master's degree in art history uh, so in academic studies and I work on these books to try to kind of you know fill in areas of um, holes in education that I thought was missing when I was a student with the drawing or the anatomy and I also work quite a bit on academic text. So um, it's kind of a different background uh, than maybe some of the other professors or instructors through this uh, the online schooling so I just think it's good to um, introduce to what would maybe a little bit different so that you have a, a point of view for where my background might be and um, just to be kind of upfront. Uh, this is, I've just kind of gone progressively through the science so you kind of see what's there. Uh, the main intention really is to have resources available for all of you um, and any other students that visit. Uh, this is the blog section which I do update or I try to update quite a bit and um, I also will show um, or like to talk real quickly about some of the links that are here. Um, so this, I'll post up lectures all the time. Um, sometimes just sketches, sometimes longer studies, anything really that I've done that day in drawing class or that I think may be good uh, as supplementary material to the textbook that I've put out. So in that sense for me it's like a uh, consistently ongoing uh, way to update a book you know, which is a very static kind of finite object when it's in circulation. So I've always thought of this you know, in the rare chance between editions I get to you know, update the book with new drawings and stuff, but I've always hoped that people would look to this as a way for for me to always give extra content, you know, to something that is more or less kind of permanent uh, as a resource. So it always allows me to hopefully better it. Um, but otherwise, what it serves for is a way for me to help you with um, uh, suggested artists. I think there's you know a lot of great artists on this list that I'll I'll try to update and add to progressively but also different resources for you as students. So to kind of mention the elephant in the room, this is a figure drawing class where we don't draw f figures in real life, which I think a lot of people seem to find to be kind of weird and bizarre 
Um, but it's, I don't think, a problem. I think there's a lot of kind of connection to, like, being in the room with a figure, have like a romantic kind of idea of what it is to draw the person and to experience the figure in 3D space. But we're talking about concepts in this class and ways of analyzing. Um, so what I use as a reference or suggest that students use is uh, this great website that Hong has set up called characterdesigns.com. And there's a great, huge number of photo sets here uh, that you can go through and kind of use as reference poses uh, for your homework. And so, um, again, going back to what I was saying, that's characterdesign.com. The other one is Pose Maniacs. Uh, but I think the thing that people don't get, and I mean, ideally, of course, everybody would be drawing from the figure all the time, but that's just not the case. That's not everybody's, it's not practical for everyone. So, being that what we're really drawing in this class is concepts, ideas about how to see, how to interpret the figure that's what we're drawing. We're drawing the concepts, we're drawing the idea of how to present the figure or design it. Being that the figure is not directly in front of us isn't going to impede that because it's an intellectual, it's an analytical endeavor that we're really focused on uh, in that sense. So hopefully you'll find that to be the case. That being said, um, this is Pose Maniacs. It's another one that's listed. It's another great site where you can kind of see uh, different views um, you know, this is obviously much more dedicated to anatomy. That's not the focus of this class per se. Um, but the character design, especially for when we're doing the tone or the different types of uh, tonal or compositional studies, are probably much more beneficial. But that being said, these are two resources. I know that many of you have ideas of uh, many more uh, different sites. Uh, these are just ones that I tend to use or recommend quite a bit. Uh, but in addition to that, one of the best and probably most underused uh, references for homework would be the great masters, Michelangelo, Rubens, anybody. And I just I don't want to stop it too, but the list is endless. The, the people that you could look at, Degas, uh, Tiepolo, Durer, anybody uh, has something that you can learn from. And they've all drawn figures. So what I'm going to ask for you to do is to change the mindset that you may have about seeing and experiencing the 3D in real life as being of primary importance and instead think about how what you really should be thinking about is understanding analytically the figure through choices that others have made if we're looking at history especially in the sense of compositions so I know this must sound like a lot that I'm giving to you right now but hopefully it'll become clearer and clearer as we go on um, again, just all to reiterate, what I'm trying to get at is uh, that it's okay. And I think that the setback of not having a figure really isn't much of one at all. Um, of course, you need to be drawing as much as possible, but again, we're drawing the ideas. So this is the blog. It's the website. Um, I post up here, but I'll also be posting stuff as much as possible on the CGMA side as well. So don't feel like you have to check in here. I'll have content that's specific for you um, all on that site into our portal. Okay, um, other stuff that I'd like to show that I'll also give you, um, email to you all, is the proposed outline, or like I guess you could think of it as a syllabus for this class. It's a way for me to let you know exactly what to expect. And so hopefully you've already been given one of these and had a chance to look it over. Um, so the course description you've read and uh, it's something that you looked at, I'm sure, before you registered for the class. Um, the prerequisite is the analytical figure drawing class, the first one. Um, so that being said, if you haven't taken that class and it's just that the subject matter of the second one appealed to you more, I think that would be fine. Um, I do recommend that you would have the textbook um, just because it's impossible for me to cover that class class that would support in a sense some of the material that we're actually doing in the second class as I do these lectures so it may make more sense to you have you had the first one for me to review and build on concepts that have already uh, been presented to you and exist in your your drawing kind of skill set uh, but that being said um, I think that that can also be supplemented with the Q&As and how I may be able to answer questions or prevent, present additional information to you in those hour blocks. So um, this sheet uh, is good to present just the first week so you know what the class is. Um, 
Today we're talking about drapery, which has in it an implicit and required review of structure, of the landmarks, of gesture, because all of that has to come through in the drapery. So really what the drapery is, is it's a way for me to give you something new, but on the other hand, remind you of stuff that happened in week one and two of the last analytical figure drawing course. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to do today or this week, but uh, that being said, you know, take it part by part or piece by piece. Um, week two, so next week, the week after, we'll work on um, hands and feet, which is something that we can get to do in the first class just because of time. Um, those subjects will both follow the same progression as things that we did in the analytical figure drawing class. There will be a review of the skeleton, a look at the anatomy, and then a build into the process and construction so that you have a wealth of information, but then ultimately you have a system and you have a series of tools from which you can construct and invent these things, uh, hopefully. Week four is another kind of filler subject in the sense that we didn't go too far into the features, anatomy of the face and neck in the head drawings week of the first class. Uh, and that's because it's a class or that initial lecture on the head was all about construction. How do I visualize the skull in dimensional language? And this is about adding to that already established idea. So it's an extension of. And then week five, six will be about lighting. How can we now add light to the forms that we really well understand? And then the last two weeks on composition, which is essentially, now that I have all this information, what can I do with it? Or at least, how can I think about it? Uh, in a way that articulates an idea. So that is the the outline. It's the basic overview in a very short abbreviated sense for where this class will go, what will be covered. Um, I don't want you to think that anything different will be happening um, and it's good so that if you think or wanted something that isn't going to be in the course then you can know immediately that this isn't the right one. So again it's great it would be great to have the the book as I think it'll help you understand some of the things that I'm saying it also will have a lot more in the way of um, examples but if you don't I know some of you live probably in parts of the world where it just isn't available or Amazon's gonna charge you an arm and a leg and your firstborn child to get it so in that sense um, I'm gonna just make sure that I have as much visual information on the CGMA site so that is my short spiel on welcoming you, uh, telling you a bit about myself, giving you some background and resources, and throwing you right into this second analytical figure drawing course. Okay, so now that you've had your whirlwind introduction, um, we're going to get right into the subject for this week, which is drapery. And so what I've done here is done a very kind of quick or uh, reductive sketch of the skeleton. Um, the skeleton in the way that we viewed it in the gesture class, um, or the part one of analytical figure drawing, uh, where we looked at the anatomy and shapes and the design of the landmarks, uh, which are the visible point of the skeleton pushing through the skin. And that is crucial for today. Uh, the crucial aspect to that is that we're going to utilize the drapery in a way that still maintains everything that we did. So um, the drawing that we're ultimately going to build on today is this figure from the Tiepolo painting. Uh, so this is a fragment or kind of detail from that uh, larger work. And what I think might be good is just to do the build up so that you know exactly what it is that um, I'm talking about if maybe it was just a while since the last class or if you just went right to this one. So gesture uh, for me is always the kind of loose identification of the figure, um, always done with an asymmetrical line uh, or relationship of asymmetrical lines to manifest what is kind of one of the more natural or most natural things about the body, the human figure, passive and active anatomy. So the idea that our arms or legs or what have you um, in our body actually is designed like that. 
or was designed with asymmetry uh, so that I can work. And this is my biggest point of contention with people that draw contour. Um, and I'm not talking about kind of accomplished, kind of beautifully rendered contour studies that capture the life-life qualities of the figure. But uh, when I say contour, I mean more kind of student work, um, like my own. And that's what I'm kind of speaking of as personal experience. Um, contour studies that look at the outside of the form, you know, like um, symmetrical lines, which it's not. And so it'll be like that view of the arm. Uh, instead, I go with stuff like this to set it up, um, but it, in, a, in essence, is an abstraction of the most important qualities of the figure, how the anatomy moves it. So that's how I always begin, and hopefully that's something that's familiar to you as far as uh, laying in the figure. Uh, and when we did lay in the figure in that prior week, or just in gesture in general, uh, it's starting with the head and then moving down the spine. So the spine is that uh, three-part cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, um, also asymmetrical form right, that is a series of curves and counterbalances uh, that allow us to visualize and design this passive and active motion through the torso specifically. So the neck, the cervical, the counterline, the thoracic, and then the final curve at the bottom, the lumbar. Uh, in that gesture, I always do work towards the weight-bearing leg, and that would be the one that he's obviously balanced on. And it's a great painting. One of the things I like most about this figure is the feel of motion, right? that we do get the idea here that he's mid-dance or twisting, kind of moving around. And there's a lot of indications to that in the way that the figure is designed and in the way that the drapery is used. And so that's one of the things I want to be especially clear or at least uh, focused on today is how the drapery is designed. Um, what's done with it to communicate, not to draw it to make it look rendered, uh, to make it look like fabric that's in front of you, which to me isn't important unless it's part of the overall idea. Um, it's much more important to illustrate a story or a concept about what you're drawing uh, than it is to just draw what's there because you can make it look like a photograph. Okay, so I've worked what, in what would be a very normal process approach to laying in the figure, uh, at least from the way that I work. Head to the weight-bearing leg using these asymmetrical lines to set up a visual pathway uh, in the sense that these lines always move our eye. Right? They're coercing us in a direction and we talked about that as counter to what symmetrical lines do, which is the opposite. Is that in a sense, they actually close off these forms. It's a principle of visual art called closure, that if you have two symmetrical lines, we as viewers will close them off, and hence no continuity or travel or passage through those. And always second is a pathway created to the secondary leg or just form because right? it may not be the leg that's bearing the secondary area of support but here the leg is raised and pulled back and so as I discussed in the intro uh, this is an example of analyzing the figure through concept and right? I don't I'm not trying to match verbatim line for line tone for tone uh, to reproduce it like a Xerox machine here I'm really interested in gleaning whatever kind of ideas I can from this and more than that to exercise the ideas that I already have uh, in the development of something new. Arms developed off of pathways um, that are opportunistically given maybe from the torso area drawn so I'm always looking to build and relate lines and in that sense my drawing will have a very consistent feeling of unity, regardless of the fact that there's so much disparate line, kind of fragmenting curve, by the fact that all of them relate in that asymmetrical pattern, there is a unity that exists overall. So that would be gesture, the relationship. So we talked about what it is that we've done. The relationship is that I can immediately start to consider the drapery into that. 
in the exact same way. So let's say that uh, I am inventing a figure or interested in inventing a figure. I would start to work out the same types of ideas. And in this sense, maybe what's going to start to happen is that I'm going to be again integrating or unifying the figure and the drapery as two commonly joined things. Right? They're both engaged in this movement, right? in this same action. Right? So I could place um, just very loosely a lot of these lines consistently. Uh, but what I'm looking to do with these is have them still integrate. So this curve still feeds in. All of these curves have a relationship to pre-existing gesture lines. And that's one thing is that I, I really do like to try to get that feel that the gesture as an idea should extend into the drapery. It's not just about the figure. It's about movement. It's about analyzing the act of movement. So in that sense, we want to be able to just cross the bridge. Right? If, if this is an, um, if gesture is an objective artistic tool about showing asymmetry and movement, it doesn't matter what I'm drawing. So in that sense, a great theme for this class is going to be a sense of generative thought. That simple principles, when understood as such, objectively, can become great ways to um, depart into any other subject. Right? I can look at animals the same way. I can look at drapery. I can look at anything any organic form uh, with this tool. So it just doesn't matter. As long as you understand the concept objectively, the subject can be anything that you apply it to. So in that sense, we have our, we have our gesture done. And it's also hopefully given you the idea how it can be something rela related or relative to um, our subject today. The next is to see the form and the construction, which is absolutely crucial to, again, what we're doing today. Uh, what you see that I've done here for our uh, kind of boring but important because he's a representative skeleton shape is that I have those shapes. The same ones that we did uh, use or that I talk about in the second chapter of the textbook. Uh, the rib cage is an egg and the pelvis is an egg that is directly underneath it. Uh, these two shapes are the primary masses that I build anatomy on, that I build the skeleton out of, that I understand form through. And the basic principle of how these exist or are built is usually a subtractive or additive. And what I mean by that very simply is that from these simple egg shapes I add things by building other forms on top or take away by slicing maybe part of the egg off to make a sharp plane for a box. So in that sense, I'd want to add that here. So the next stage for the landmark process, if we were continuing to develop this drawing, would be to show the rib cage and the pelvis. Uh, what you're going to notice that'll be different about it in this drawing from that guy is that these are going to be moving with the gesture. Right? So the rib cage here has this diagonal lean because the thoracic section is pulled back and that the pelvis is going to be higher on this side because that's where the weight-bearing form is. Um, from there we built the connections C and S curves just so we don't have floating disembodied parts. So there's my connection S here for the stretch, C here for the pinch of the rib cage, and then same thing here to get the neck. And I'm just at this point trying to see through the hair. And I'm just don't want to draw anything that's there contour based so I'm still thinking about the basic form that is the throat or the neck here and that would be my transitional step of taking the gesture which is line so I almost also organize all these parts line now we've done shape next we will do volume and through volume, what we're looking for is the landmarks. Which brings us up to our direct point of comparison today, is that when we start to study drapery, what I want to show is just a renewed sense of what the landmark can do for me. So to present the landmarks for the back, 
uh, very quickly. Again, I'm sensitive to the time and the amount of attention that you're willing to give to the lectures, but I also don't want to leave anybody in the cold. So uh, I want to make sure that there's some form of review. This would be the cranial mass. Here are our vertebrae, the seventh cervical here, scapula, which is what controls the arm, on either side. And then on the bottom, uh, we'll see the floating rib, which would be the twelfth rib here on the back, into the lumbar section. And finally, the sacrum, which is the bone in the back of our pelvis that fuses uh, the two halves together. Pelvis would be seen here, the posterior superior iliac spine, and then into the arms and legs, where here we would have the head of the humerus, the lateral and medial epicondyle, and then the ulna and the radius. Same thing on this side. So again, this is the skeletal layover, and you can see how the gesture feeds it, right? that it sets up that lyrical motion that you then become more rigorous and bring into life through this kind of anatomical or skeletal knowledge. Here would be the great trochanter of the femur. Femur, now I'm giving it a, a much more kind of um, strict position, straighter line, especially here for that weight-bearing leg. Fibula would be on the outside, and then the tibia here. It gives us that asymmetry in bone. Okay, so that would bring us to our landmark stage minus the volume which is the last thing that we would have to do here. So uh, let's add another layer and then just do that on top. And the reason that I'm showing or going through this in addition to being concerned for review and making sure that everybody understands how I'm approaching the figure is because it's how I'd expect to see the homework. So the way that I'm setting this all up is to immediately throw you in or acclimate you to the way that you should be analyzing these same types of drawings for homework. Um, from the back view, we always took landmarks, or I will always take them, and line them up to find and identify the planes of the body. So by lining them up on the back, we can here identify a back plane. From the 12th rib to the top of the scapula gives you the height of that back plane. And because the rib cage is pushed down by that thoracic section, we will generally see it from above, which means that the above from the back view, which means that this depth is going to raise. So if we were to see a front view, we would be seen underneath the rib cage. So here's my box. And then the same thing. Sacrum as a form is pointing this way. So I see a three-quarter representation for the pelvis. And again, just finding a height, a width, and a depth. Now, as always, it looks remedial, it looks easy, it looks generic, but what I want is for my lines to describe this, my lines of drapery. And so what drapery can become is an excellent way to not have to do what I'm doing now, but you have to know what's there. Uh, I can make all of my lines describe these same planes just by curving the drapery in a specific way and it'll look solid. It's the people that don't see this or have the foresight to kind of see it as they're drawing that will make their lines look very flat. And so that's what I'm trying to, to make sure that you have is that, again, we had the transition in the first step between the movement that the gesture creates and how to influence the drapery with it so that they become part of the same thing with landmarks, you want the same quality to your drapery. You don't want your drapery to feel flat or stiff, so you want it to maintain and occupy that same sense of volume. And if you remember to the anatomy and the way that we handled it, it's simply a matter of when we get to that stage with the drapery of giving it T overlaps and wrapping lines, which was the only two things we ever used to show volume in the anatomy. So here's my legs just a simple or a few simple cylinders in the first step between